Professor C. Naganna is a visiting mm -hmm. professor in Koenbu Institute of Kannada Studies, University mm -hmm. of Mysore. Formerly, he was a member of Project Advisory Committee of NTM and Professor of Comparative Literature and Translation Studies. He is a poet, critic, translator and a public speaker. So far, he has authored some 50 books in Kannada and English. He is also a director of publication division in Mysore University. He was a member of Kannada Advisory Committee of Bharatiya Gyanapita, Saraswati Samman, Central Saita Academy and Karnataka Saita Academy. He received an honor in number of awards from number of organizations for his service in the field of literature and culture. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor C. Nagarna to deliver the lecture. I warmly welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am uh, deeply indebted to you for introducing me to this uh, August assembly scattered all over the country, perhaps. So thank you once again, uh, Ms. Juni. Straight away, I will start my lecture. The topic given to me is uh, the intricacies of translating knowledge texts. At a particular point of time, science was progressing in full swing and they could not find the appropriate words in the English language to describe new phenomena and therefore they must have decided to borrow words from other languages. This is not that much applicable in the domain of humanities. What I am trying to refer to is applicable more in the uh, field of science than perhaps humanities. In all other subjects like economics, sociology and uh, political science, the ideas would not remain confined within the four walls. So they would percolate quickly to the common trans transaction and be a part of the daily vocabulary. Therefore, in these subjects, we can find the common language as an adequate vehicle of ideas. It was natural in those days to depend upon the Latin language, which was accessible to the scholars. Now the ancient Greeks, worked in the domains of science and philosophy and hence they converted their language into an adequate vehicle to carry their ideas. Therefore, the English language imported many Greek words in these fields. When they felt the necessity of technical terminology, further they employed the word stems uh, in Sanskrit, we call Shabda Kanda, the word stems, and suffixes and prefixes, which are called Pratyayas in Sanskrit, from both Greek and Latin languages to coin new words. Hence, we can put into three categories the technical terms used in the English language, for instance. First, the words of common usage that have been employed as technical terms. Please remember, this is the first category, the words of common usage that have been employed as technical uh, terms. Second category, words borrowed from Greek and Latin languages. Third category, the words coined with the help of word stems and suffixes and prefixes from Greek and Latin languages. As has already been mentioned, the words like work, energy, force, power, salt, base, fruit, they all belong to the first category, the words of common usage as technical terminology. That is the first category. All these words that I refer, refer to just now, namely work, energy, force, power, salt, base, fruit, they all belong to the first category. Run, over, maiden, etc. have a special meaning in the game of cricket, as you know. Likewise, they have special meaning in the fields of 
physics, chemistry, and biology. Now, the moment I invoke certain words like zoom, close up, long shot, wide angle, montage, collage, etc., you would immediately, immediately connect them with the world of the cinema, celluloid world. So that is the reason why certain words are used in a particular domain. The words of daily usage, for example, because of their familiarity, do not serve the purpose of being technical terminology. So that is the inherent danger we have. Okay, The words of daily usage, because of their familiarity, do not serve the purpose of being technical terminology. Luckily, such words do not even constitute 1% in any language, for example. We have to take this into account while coining technical terminology in Kannada, that is the language of Karnataka. So the Latin words like fulcrum, larva, cortex, locus, cerebrum, cornea, and the Greek words like thorax, stigma, iris, etc., belong to this second category of borrowing, namely words borrowed from Greek and Latin. Technical terminologies are deliberately coined with a lot of conscious effort. Uh, I think all the languages coin their technical terminologies. Since science has flourished by leaps and bounds during the last 200 or uh, 300 years, we can say that no one language was able to supply the required technical terminology. So no language can say, for example, I am self-sufficient and I don't have to depend upon other sources or languages in order to obtain my technical terminology. So every language in that sense is dependent on other languages to coin technical terminology. By and large, the words are coined with the help of Latin and Greek words. Take a word like gastropod. In Greek language, gastro means stomach and pod means food. Gastropod. Combining these two words, we get the third word called gastropod, which refers to the animals which crawl on their stomach. So uh, the meaning is very clear now. Similarly, the parts from Latin language like super and uh, the Greek language, uh, the word son, they are combined to get another word called supersonic. Now super is Latin, son is Greek, and combining these two, Latin and Greek words, we get the word supersonic, uh, which means beyond the speed of sound. Now therefore, while finding technical terms, the scientists were rather uninhibited and did not remain puritanical. Now, certain language people are always puritanical in the sense they don't want their language to be corrupted by the addition of other languages. So such an attitude is called a puritanical attitude, but scientists are quite uninhibited in the sense that they allow other language to seep into their system because ultimately what is more important is how they are going to enhance the technical terminology vocabulary, which is their end and aim. So for example, they joined the Greek root tele to the Latin source vis and to create a word like television. So the Greek and Latin words tele and uh, vis have given us uh, the very important word television. So the words like pluviometer, and audio meter are similarly formed. One Greek, one Latin part, and two parts combined together will give a new word, which is very, very effective for scientific communication. One Dr. Flood from the University of Birmingham has made a list of 1,150 words, such words formed by joining Latin and Greek words. So he has shown that such uh, suffixes and prefixes have created hundreds and thousands of words that we use as uh, technical terms in different branches of science. So it is estimated that uh, about 150 such words have formed a base for the technical terminology in medicine, for example. 
So we said that by observing how the English language coined its technical terms, we can learn a lesson to form technical terms in our mother tongues. For example, my mother tongue is Kannada, and I know how uh, technical terminologies are formed. Similarly, uh, if a person whose mother tongue is Tamil, or Punjabi, or uh, Assamese, etc., etc., they also learn taking a leaf out of the English experience. But there is a need to coin a word that reflects the genius of the language. Now, all of us must take care that we understand what we mean by the genius of a language. So this is extraordinarily important uh, to uh, you know, come out with new technical terms. So we have a way out, and that is, just as the Europeans depended on Latin and Greek languages, we have to depend upon the Sanskrit language. There is no other go. The Europeans uh, heavily depended upon the Latin and Greek languages. Similarly, we have to depend upon the Sanskrit language, which has come down to us as a great boon. Then we have to seriously think under what circumstances we can borrow the English technical terms and similarly, when we can coin Sanskrit terms. We know under what circumstances technical terminologies are required and when we have to apply those terms in order to obtain the uh, meaningful knowledge in our sources. So we also have to think about the way in which we can coin Sanskrit terms. Are there any thumb rules we can follow in coining words? It's a very important question. Are there any thumb rules? Uh, taking advantage of them, we can forge ahead. Whenever we encounter a technical term, the question we need to ask is whether we can use it as it is, or should we find an equivalent with the help of Sanskrit language? Three questions need to be answered first in this regard. Question number one. To what extent the word is technical? Question number two, is it used in English in its original form or is it used as an adjective or a derivative? This is the second question. And the third question is, does it go with the Kannada language smoothly or does it appear to be too alien? I said Kannada because that happens to be my mother tongue, but that can be replaced with any other language. Therefore, uh, what is important is that word that you coin, the technical term, does it go smoothly with your language? This is what we call the genius of the language. And under all circumstances, we can never, never sacrifice this particular point. The genius of the language decides the validity or the efficacy of the technical term. If the word is too technical, and if it appears only in the knowledge texts, then there is no need to find an equivalent in our language. We can use it as it is. So uh, we must be very careful in deciding what is too technical and what is not. For example, there is no need to coin equivalents to words like Hydrocortisone, a word like hydrocortisone, another word like mitochondria, yet another word like Elon Vital, etc., etc. There is absolutely no need to translate them into our respective mother tongues. Words like hydrocortisone, mitochondria, and Elon Vital. The question is whether a word can find its way into common usage despite its status as a technical terminology. Sometimes the ordinary words can be turned or transformed into technical terminology. And technical terminology can also be transformed into common usage words. Either way is possible. For example, a word like allergy. This is a very important test case for all of us. Take uh, this word allergy. It has found its way into common parlance. Somehow everyone uses allergy as if it is the word 
occurring in their own language. We can use it as it is in the Kannada language, probably the Punjabi language, the Assamese, Gujarati, Sindhi language, people also can use allergy as if it is their own language. So we can use it as it is because by using it so, there is no damage done to the flow of the language and its euphony. Now, whenever we describe or decide the genius of a language, the concept called euphony comes into play. Those of you who are familiar with what we call euphony, the correct sound, the easy flow of the word, and its capacity to merge with the general uh, ecosystem of the language, that decides the euphony of a new word that you are going to coin. If it is not euphonym, you, you for, uh, euphonymous or whatever, then you reject that word. Euphony is important under all circumstances. But we cannot say the same thing about words like equilibrium. Allergy is okay. All languages have accepted a word like allergy as if it is their own mother tongue. But take, for instance, another word like uh, equilibrium or at another word like acceleration. They don't merge with the vernacular language or the bhashas, as we call them nowadays. Okay, so therefore equilibrium, acceleration, they don't merge with our language. Therefore, we need to coin technical terms for them. Likewise, we have to coin equivalence to words like velocity, temperature, resonance, relativity, etc. Words that reflect action, for example, diffuse, precipitate, decompose. Though not technical, certain words are used majorly in knowledge texts. They are symmetry, constant, index, reversible, overlap, etc. These are words which are uh, used only as technical terms. They are not part of our uh, common uh, parlance, so to say. How to find an appropriate equivalent is the biggest question. We scratch our head to arrive at an appropriate equivalent with the help of the Sanskrit language. This kind of obduracy or obstinacy is sometimes counterproductive. Now we say we have to depend upon Sanskrit alone. So that is an obstinate point of view. So you, you, that is a kind of fixation, let us say. So take the case of a word like fossil as an example. This word does not pose any problem as it is simple. You can keep fossil as it is. We can retain the word fossilu in Kannada. I don't know whether you can do the same in Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam. Now the experts recommend you better keep a word like fossil in your language uh, as well without making any change. For example, what happened in my own language, uh, the experts, you know, those who coined the technical terminology, uh, may took a lot of liberty in coming out with equivalents, but eventually they uh, did not succeed much. And finally, when they retained the word fossil as it is in our language, then there was a degree of success. So somebody coined the word paleolike for fossil, and uh, it is not a fossil is not a paleolike, the residue, for example. It, it, it is the remains of a live thing, according to the etymological meaning, dictionary definition. If a fossil means it is the remains of a live thing. Then again, somebody suggested, let us call it jivavashesha. Jivavashesha, they thought, is the equivalent of fossil. Someone is uh, incorporated, uh, someone incorporated correction by saying that fossil is not the avashesha of jiva. Since it is the avashesha of jivi, let us call it jivyavashesha. Avashesha plus jivi, jivyavashesha, they said. That also attracted criticism. Jivyavashesha is not the appropriate equivalent, they said. Even if you find the bone of an animal which is dead in the recent past, it is the avashesha of that GV. Therefore, GV avashesha is not the appropriate equivalent. This is the dead 
animal dead in the recent past. When we say fossil, it requires the fact that it should have uh, uh, died long, long ago. So therefore, they said fossil should indicate the remains of an animal that lived long, long ago. Only then you can call it Jeeva Vishesha or Jeeva Vishesha. Even those two terms are not adequate, they say. This argument only says that one can go on discussing about the difficulties involved in arriving at an appropriate equivalent because that is the whole burden of the translators and the knowledge text book writers. You know, in Latin, fodore, fodire means to dig. Fossus is its verbal status. Therefore, fossil only means something that is taken out of, taken out by digging. That meaning should reflect uh, in our coinage. The meaning the word carries now is the meaning we have given to it. It is not the, there in the word itself. So this particular point should be taken very, very carefully. If we want to keep Paliulike or Jeevavashesha as an equivalent to fossil, then what are we going to do for fossilization? Can we say Paliulike Aguvike or Jeevavasheshi Karana? It does not good, uh, look good at all. We can't say Paliulike Aguvike or Jeevavasheshi Karana and both of them does not do, do not go with the genius of our language. So if we keep fossil for fossil, then it is possible to have fossili karana because that flows unhindered in our throat. And then one thing emerges out of this discussion, and that is in technical terms, it is the meaning we give to them that sticks. We feel the meaning into them which we require. So that is all. Uh, I am thinking of at another example. A word like spectrum means a scene in Latin. Nothing more, just a scene. Yeah. The meaning we have given to it is far from its actual meaning. Similarly, in Greek, menos means sparse, meter means a measuring instrument. But manometer means an instrument to measure pressure. What this indicates is that we shall accept the words as technical terms if they are amenable to obtain derivatives. Fossil, if you keep fossil, fossili karana, fossilization is possible. Uh, similarly, take uh, for instance another word like ion. Can be ayanu in Kannada, ayan in English can be ayanu in Kannada because it is easy to obtain its derivatives. I'm going to give you a list of derivatives from a word like ion. It gives rise to ionic, ionize, ionization, ionized. Respectively, the Kannada equivalent becomes ayanika, ayani karisu, ayani karana, ayani krita. For all these four English derivatives, we can have beautiful Kannada equivalents as I just now showed to you. In cases where the English terminology is a single word and not a compound word, it is better to coin a single word in our mother tongue also. For example, a word like spectrum to which I have already referred, they have coined in my language as Varna Patala for spectrum, they have said Varna Patala would do. Spectrum is one word, whereas Varna Patala is a compound word. Since it is a compound word, it is not easy to get the derivatives. What we are going to do for spectroscope, for instance, spectrophotometer, mass spectrometer, etc., etc. It is very difficult to obtain new coinages out of compound words. Therefore, what they did was for spectrum, they said Rohita is the best equivalent. Rohita. Rohita means seven colors in Sanskrit. This is much better. Similarly, it is better to use Avega 
for momentum avega for momentum earlier they said chalana parimana is suffice that is the equivalent they thought of in the beginning for momentum but now we have changed it to avega avega is one word chalana parimana is a compound word and uh, for another example is ellipse they said dirgha vrutta for ellipse they said dirgha vrutta and then later on we changed it to anda anda is better it is one word and uh, dirgha vrutta is a compound word so therefore these changes have been taking place to get to understand the genius of our language and to grapple with the meaning of the words normally english technical terms are formed with the help of greek and latin suffixes and stems we have to think of sanskrit stems and suffixes in this context as i have already made a reference to it during the course of my lecture we shall not lose sight of the word for wood for the trees by focusing on the meaning only on one area we make the technical term very narrow in its function so the example that comes to my mind is frequency for frequency they coined kampana sankhya probably to indicate the movement of the waves kampana sankhya for pre frequency probably to indicate the movement of the waves but the word frequency occurs in other disciplines like statistics and uh, genetics also there we have to coin new words for frequency remember the freak the word frequency occurs in statistics and also in genetics therefore if it occurs in uh, two different disciplines two or three different disciplines every time you have to coin new words as equivalents uh, we cannot indulge in this luxury because it is a luxury to think of so many coinages no language can afford to have so many coinages the word frequency has no reference to kampana or vibration it has no reference to numbers either it only means occurring again and again that's the meaning of the word frequency it only means occurring again and again to indicate this phenomenon we have a word like avartana that beautifully uh, brings out the meaning of frequency here uh, so therefore kampana uh, is ruled out and other possibilities are ruled out and we have stuck to the new coin or uh, coinage avartan therefore the different roles the word frequency plays is taken care of by the word avartan when we do so we can achieve the economy of words ultimately what is important when we discuss the topic of technical terminology is we must derive maximum meaning maximum uh transaction with minimum words that is the soul and whole idea so when we do so we can achieve economy of words similarly for a word like condensation they have coined bashpikarana in my language again it comes from the sanskrit source as you all know perhaps so ba condensation is bashpikarana as an equivalent by this word this but this word does not indicate the twin processes of vapor becoming liquid and liquid becoming solid so when you coin a new technical terminology it should reflect both the processes of vapor becoming liquid and liquid becoming solid so we need a word that stands for both this process namely if you stick to the original idea of condensation we have to have a word like sandri karana not bashpi karana but sandri karana would uh, uh, meet the requirement which meets the requirement quite adequately when we coin equivalence we shall keep the meaning of words in our mind under all circumstances otherwise it leads to confusion take the word symmetry for this we have in our language quite a few <clears throat> equivalents namely some people say saushthava some people say samangate some people say samaparshvate as equivalents for 
symmetry. There is a word called word called isomerism. This pertains to the atoms. In Greek language, isos means equal and meros means part. Therefore, they called isomers as samangigalo and isomerism as samangate. Now look at the confusion. For symmetry also, we coined samangate and for isomerism also we said samangate is adequate. How can the same word stand for both symmetry and isomerism? The etymological meaning of symmetry is symmetros, meaning with measure. The Sanskrit word samiti represents the same thing. So we got an extraordinarily beautiful equivalent when we say samiti for symmetry. Moreover, it is easy to pronounce as well. Now we talked about euphony and it, it, it uh, really it, uh, serves the purpose. Samiti for symmetry is uh, just like we said geometry, geometry for geometry, etc. For trigonometry, we said trigonometry. Similarly, uh, for symmetry, it is samiti in Sanskrit. Therefore, symmetry can have samiti as an equivalent. Symmetrical, it's derivative. Derivative of uh, symmetry is symmetrical. And then we already got the word samiti for symmetry. Now, what are you going to do for symmetrical? I think samita is the uh, required word there. Thus, you can. Uh, for new coinages. Hence, it is necessary to have a knowledge of the Sanskrit stems and suffixes. Without the knowledge of Sanskrit stems and suffixes and prefixes, probably we are not going to get the uh, required uh, equivalence. Just as they have collected the word stems, suffixes, prefixes of the Greek and Latin languages to enable them to form technical terms, we have to make similar attempts to collect all the suffixes and prefixes of the Sanskrit languages, language. That will help us a great deal in obtaining the technical terminology. That leaves me some space to talk about how the Western authors produce their textbooks in the knowledge domain. This I gather from the forewords of the Kannada translations of great science texts. In 1973, our zoology professor, Dr. H. B. Devra Sarkar, translated into Canada a thousand page work called Life of Vertebrates by J. Z. Yen. The title of the original work is Life of Vertebrates by J. Z. Yen. And uh, this was translated in 1973, a thousand page book. And uh, uh, Professor Sarkar uh, called it Kasheru Kagura. Dr. Devra Sarkar's experience is worth noting here. I quote, when I started translating this book, I picked it up with a lot of enthusiasm. But only when I proceeded a bit, I realized that I was entering into an unknown world. I have read my textbooks as a student. I have read many textbooks as a student and as a teacher. Probably my attention then was different and I seem to have concentrated on collecting information. When I actually started translating this magnum opus, I had to weigh each and every word and each and every sentence. I came to realize that this is not a mere science book, but a book with a lot of literary flourish. The author has communicated in simple and straightforward language, even the most complex ideas of science. Now, I think we have to pay a good deal of attention to what the translator, Professor H.B. Devraj Sarkar has said regarding the original text and its beauty. It is not merely a book of science, he says, rather there is a lot of literary flourish and it, the translator should be able to, you know, respond adequately to the literary quality of the original text. So uh, I was overwhelmed by the eloquent style of the original work, 
he says, I was overwhelmed by the eloquent style of the original book. So I have tried to express, he continues further, I am quoting at great length, because those of you want to translate uh, the original English text into your own mother tongue, uh, will have a kind of thumb rule given by Professor Devraj Sarkar. He says, I have tried to express in simple Kannada without making the narration loose and slipshod. To what extent I have succeeded, I don't know. The teachers and the students who use this book are in a better position to judge, he says. Now, it's interesting to know what the original author, J. Z. Young, has uh, said in his preface. He says, if we take note of history of textbooks, it becomes at once clear that one scholar has his hand in the pocket of another scholar. Just like the age old proverb we say, uh, one poet will always have his hand in, an, in the pocket of another poet. This science writer says, if we take note of the history of textbooks, it becomes at once clear that one scholar has his hand in the pocket of another scholar, that too, even the mistakes are copied and hence textbooks do not attract people, he says. Further, he says, you will understand when you read this book that textbooks reflect an attitude. It's not as if they are uh, completely impersonal. Textbooks are not completely impersonal. There is always uh, some clue regarding the personality of the textbook writer also. This is what he means by saying that when you read this book, the textbooks reflect an attitude. But still textbooks have their own significance that cannot be ruled out. So another book I went through in the recent past was a textbook of inorganic chemistry by Dr. J.R. Partington. Uh, it was uh, written in the year 1921, uh, very old book, 1921, J.R. Partington's textbook on chemistry, inorganic chemistry, which was translated into Kannada by Professor Subha Bhatta in 1972 as Inorganic Rasayana Shastra. Inorganic Rasayana Shastra. Subha Bhatta says at the beginning, I quote, I was a graduate student in 1921. J.R. Partington's a textbook of inorganic chemistry had just then appeared in England. Soon it became a very favorite book all over. It was not merely a textbook, but it had all the qualities of a reference book. J.R. Partington says this about his own book. I have not written this book keeping any examination in mind, but it is adequate to fulfill the requirement of the intermediate and B.Sc. students of the British universities. Unquote. But the book became very popular among the students of the Indian universities as well. Before I conclude, I would like to make a mention of the textbooks brought out by the National Translation Mission of CIIL, Central Institute of Indian Languages, in the recent past. One such book is Fundamentals of Molecular Spectroscopy, which is translated as Anurohita Darshan of the Mulamsharu in Kannada by two of my friends, namely Professor H.S. Umesh and Professor M.K. Ramaswamy. The original author, Professor C.N. Bonwell, has said in his preface of this particular book, Fundamentals of Molecular Spectroscopy, he says that I had almost forgotten about the book, but when the publishers called and said that they have to come out with a new edition, I became conscious. My publishers, McGraw-Hill, suggested that I should have a co-author. I was skeptical in the beginning, and after I started revising the book with a young academic, E.M. McCash of York University, I began to see what a refreshing hell it was. McCash, E.M. McCash's story is still interesting. This is what the author, Professor C.N. Bonwell said, and he made a reference in his preface to one of his junior uh, colleagues, Professor McCash. And McCash has a wonderful experience to share with all of us what he felt actually when the call came from none other than the great Professor uh, C.N. Bonwell. This is McCash's opinion. 
I had purchased C. N. Barnwell's book, Fundamentals of Molecular Spectroscopy, when I was a very young. When I was very young, I had developed some kind of intimacy with the book. But when I was asked to join him to revise the book, I couldn't believe myself. I came out of the shock, and Barnwell and I discussed about the change in the book because Professor E. M. McCash had always revered Barnwell. And his book all along, but now the opportunity came to him to be a co-author to revise the book, and uh, he was completely overboard. The generosity of the author enabled me to work from a distance of 600 kilometers. I must also mention here that the undergraduate students of York and Cambridge universities made me learn many things. This is E. M. McCash. So the intricacies of producing or translating knowledge texts in our languages involves all this that i've narrated to you and much more as i've said in the course of my lecture the younger generation scholars must take a leaf out of the experiences of our own textbook writers as well as the original authors in english as we are not preparing textbooks from directly from french from german from russian and japanese sources english has been our dominant source lastly i want to emphasize that there must be a clear recognition for the textbook writers in our languages somehow they are looked down upon textbook writers are not accorded the due recognition they deserve somehow they fall outside the gamut or pale of the awards and the literature it is not considered to be literature at all they should not feel that they are doing a thankless job and nobody bothers about their intellectual labor only a saint can say that he is doing the task for his own satisfaction the rest of us desire a lot of encouragement through some kind of recognition either by the government or by the academia my fervent appeal to you especially the young scholars who are listening to this lecture is that you should also contribute your might in making our languages fit for scientific disquisitions if you for example remain unmoved and expect the older generation people to carry on the show and enrich our languages that doesn't really work for example it's like a relay race one generation passes the baton to the next generation and it is the duty of the next generation to carry the baton to the further generations and generations to come unless that process is alive and kicking then we we are not going to derive much out of such endeavors so our languages will languish and become impoverished impoverished um, day by day and we will be left in the lurch in order to avoid that kind of eventuality i think every generation must gear up and take stock of what has already been achieved in their respective languages in as far as producing activities producing knowledge texts and continue the race further there is no other way so i learned that uh, in tamil nadu they are starting an engineering college with tamil as the medium of instruction a couple of engineering colleges uh, with with tamil as medium of instruction let's hope that there will be very many takers for this course it is a bold move indeed and a path breaking move also let's hope others will take a leaf out of their experience and make a similar attempt in their respective languages there are innumerable questions regarding if you open engineering colleges or uh, medical colleges in your uh, mother tongue as a medium of instruction a lot of questions crop crop up and uh, it is an attempt worth trying all the same instead of backing out instead of coming out with alibis that technical terminologies don't exist in our languages that is the truth but we must you know somehow move forward and uh, uh, try to grapple with the changing times and produce books and uh, equally the energy the enthusiasm of 
the young generation receptors, those who received new knowledge, must also be taken into account. I think this is the only way to make our languages highly respectable and to keep pace with the changing times. So with these words, I end my lecture and I look forward to some kind of interaction from you. Thank you. Thank you.